Welcome everybody to our seminar on European security towards strategic autonomy. It is an absolute pleasure um, welcoming our speakers um, of today. Um, we have an excellent, excellent line of speakers um, lined up um, to discuss this very, very timely um, topic of today. Um, and let me um, introduce our four speakers to you. Um, Eva Maria Limetz is Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic um, of Estonia. Eva Maria, thank you so much um, for joining us today and um, taking the time. Claire Rollin is uh, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the French Republic to the Political and Security Committee of the Council of the European Union. Um, Claire, also thank you so much to you um, for joining us um, today. Then let me also join um, Sir Julian King. Um, he is Senior Advisor, Flint Global Fellow, Royal United Services Institute for Defense Studies and Oxford Internet Institute. And um, what I'm just uh, noticing, you are the lone male um, on our panel of today. Um, that is quite unusual when we have discussions um, on security issues. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us and to joining for joining this, um, this female panel. And last but not least, um, let me also introduce my good friend, Dr. Claudia Mayor. She is head of international security of the International Security Division of the German Institute for International and Sec Security Affairs here in Berlin, um, SWP. We want to take a look today at an issue which has been discussed back and forth and up and down. Um, that is the issue of um, sovereignty, strategic autonomy and security in the European Union. And it's part of a series which we are conducting at the Aspen Institute, where we have already looked at the issue of trade policy making and also at the issue of how we are dealing with great um, powers uh, such as Russia and also China, the triangle. And today we want to take a closer look at security issues. And I think that the timing, it, it fits really well. Briefly after our elections in Germany, um, shortly after the G20 summit, just when the COP um, is going on, the climate negotiations, briefly before Germany is going to take over the G7 presidency, and briefly before um, the uh, before France is going to take over um, the EU Council and before the French elections, I think that the timing couldn't be couldn't be better. Um, and I would like to start um, with you, Eva Marie uh, Maria, and ask you from the perspective of Estonians and maybe maybe even a little more generally, um, also other Baltic countries. How would you assess the current security framework? Um, in the European Union, including the EU Security Union um, strategy. Uh, thank you, thank you. And first, I would like to thank the Aspen Institute for the opportunity to take part of this uh, very important uh, debate today. Uh, European security and uh, strategic autonomy are both very topical and uh, multifaceted issues that uh, can be discussed at uh, length, of course. But I would like to share with you some thoughts about what we can do uh, in the European Union in order to strengthen our common uh, security. Uh, and I have a few points to make with this regard. But first, I would like to emphasize that Estonia is a firm supporter of human rights, democratic values and uh, rules-based international order. It is the only way that uh, to have a stable international community and to secure that every country, no matter how big or small, has a voice in the world. Uh, we must uh, stand together against threats and challenges that are trying to undermine our cooperation and, uh, and uh, development. And um, uh, these are because these are the values that help us to secure a better future for our people and, and uh, uh, also incoming uh, generations. 
But when we talk about the uh, security of the uh, European Union, then uh, we should distinguish between uh, threats and ways of uh, responding uh, to them. This year, the European Union, for the first time, compiled a joint threat assessment, which mapped the threats facing the European Union over the next 10 years. And what I would like to emphasize here is that it is remarkable how smooth the process was and how comprehensive the out outcome uh, of this uh, document is. In other words, we in the European Union, I believe, understand quite well each other and each other um, uh, and also the dangers uh, that the European, European Union is uh, facing as a whole. Differences and also often ambiguities are more about how we respond to these uh, challenges that we face. In Estonia, for example, we love a clarity of thought and we also tend to think that we are people of action. Uh, therefore, instead of uh, drawing up the concepts, we ask ourselves what kind of problem do we want to solve? How to protect Europe from the threat of terrorism or um, our societies from election interference or disinformation or cyber attacks? So there are many, many threats and challenges we would like to uh, protect our societies from and what we can do to ensure that the migration and energy resources are not uh, uh, weaponized. That is why we prefer to talk about concrete actions uh, and the ability to, to act, uh, to respond to these uh, threats and challenges. Um, uh, uh, another point I would like to make is that there is fundamental differences between whether we are talking about uh, our own defense in Europe or what we are doing outside of the uh, European Union. In Estonia, we, uh, we believe that um, uh, there is no alternative to the US strong role in European uh, security. Estonia's security will remain remain anchored into NATO's collective uh, defense, and we should also avoid creating additional or parallel defense structures in Europe. For us, the question is how to enhance the US role in European security together with a stronger and more united and resilient um, uh, EU. And here, of course, uh, I would like to also recall the recent uh, uh, meeting of, of President Biden and President Macron, and they also underlined the importance of, of uh, stronger uh, cooperation uh, between uh, or stronger transatlantic uh, cooperation, which is also, uh, from our perspective, uh, very important. Uh, we, we also witness and welcome the strengthening the EU um, defence cooperation, especially when we talk about raising defence expenditure, uh, also dealing with hybrid attacks and ensuring uh, border uh, security. This also includes cooperation in the field of uh, defence industry, industry and, and uh, for example, uh, PESCO uh, projects. Um, in addition, we support a stronger European Union in many other areas, such as uh, supply chains, uh, medicine, uh, agriculture, new technologies, uh, uh, digital and space, or also green policy, which is very topical at the moment uh, as well. Uh, when we look broader, then in the European neighborhood, we support the ISRA partnership as a and uh, also we participate in missions and operations. For example, all uh, the missions in which Estonia currently participates are in the South. Um, I share the view that the European Union must take greater responsibility in its neighborhood, including in, in Africa. And it is also important that the framework of uh, the Easter partnership, um, uh, we consider it necessary to develop security cooperation with, with uh, these countries, especially with those countries who are interested in um, uh, European integration like Ukraine, Moldova or Georgia. Through these kind of measures, we also increase the security here in Europe. So I see that my time is coming to an end or do I have still a moment to, to make a quick conclusion? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yes. Um, in conclusion, I would like to emphasize uh, that um, from our perspective, it's important to think 
to uh, to do the things which uh, uh, give additional uh, uh, value to our already um, our current activities. Also, uh, from our perspective, nature will remain a cornerstone of our collective defense. Um, but strengthening European ability to act is also a necessary and very uh, valid point. And uh, from our perspective, also unity of like-minded countries, especially here uh, among European partners, is our goal and very important one. And uh, because cooperation uh, makes us stronger. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva Maria. And we we um, we come back to you. So um, I know that you have lots of other points um, to make, but we will have an opportunity to come back to you in the dis in the discussion round. Thank you so much for this really really rich um, opening statement. And a couple of things um, I want to um, remind us for 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 the discussion of. First of all, you mentioned that um, there are great similarities in threat perception, but we disagree sometimes on the responses. That is something I would like um, to pick up on later in the discussion. And what I found also very interesting is hearing from you um, a clear statement on the United States that there is no alternative to the US as a strong security partner. Um, thank you so much and with this, I um, would like to hand over to Claire. Um, we heard from Eva Maria, or Eva Maria, you reminded us of the current meeting between uh, Biden and Macron. Uh, the reason for this was not all pleasant. I think um, there was a little bit of a disagreement um, over AUKUS um, and uh, the new security partnership, I think. Um, but before we get into this, um, Claire, um, I'm very curious hearing from you what is the French position um, on, on so sovereignty, autonomy with regard to security, how you would perceive this, and what role France is uh, playing in this debate? Many thanks, uh, many thanks, Tommy, and uh, good morning uh, to, to everybody. I will try to be uh, very short, uh, just uh, in introduction um, to, 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 to say that for us, um, sovereignty, strategic autonomy is uh, something which is, uh, we think, uh, the necessary course of action for the European Union. Because what we see, and it was uh, said also by uh, Minister Limetz uh, before me, is that we are living now in a world which is more brutal, which is uh, with more unpredictability, and we need to be ready to face uh, any kind of situation in order to defend and promote our interest and value. And in fact, uh, when we use in French autonomy strategique or uh, sovereignty, it means in fact the necessity to have the idea, the objective and the concept in order to do things. And we see that from uh, many months now and many years, uh, Europe is taking this course of action and it was done, for example, in the strategic agenda, uh, we put it, uh, we put on uh, for, uh, for the coming years from uh, 20, uh, 2019 to 2024. And um, that's why uh, it, it, it is also important to have this course of action, but to have also a strong partnership policy. And I support a lot what was said by Minister limits because as she stated uh, the joint communique between president biden and president macron last friday was very clear about what we are trying to do is strengthening our course of action in any kind of areas and the pandemic with covid19 was something clear about the need to continue uh, this course of action but we need also to make it uh, more strong uh, to make it stronger uh, regarding the defense policy and the joint communique was very clear about the fact that a more um, a stronger and more capable uh, Europe defense, European defense contributes positively to global and transatlantic security and is complementary to, to NATO. And he, this is the framework in which we are working. Now, I will try just to put uh, some uh, ideas and proposals regarding uh, what is uh, 
possible and what we can do, especially uh, in the framework of the reflection we have together between European allies uh, in the framework of the strategic uh, compass, which has to be uh, adopted uh, in the coming months in March 2022 by the European Council. The first thing I think which is important for, for Europeans is to have the ability to act and to project when necessary. Um, there is this need for a neighborhood, even if we know that NATO is a cornerstone for collective defense, and it is an essential principle which should be uh, defending and respected. But we need to be able to uh, share responsibilities in our neighborhood and to be able also to project in other parts of the world when necessary. And when we see the growing threats in Africa, in Afghanistan, for example, or the interest we have in, in, in Indo-Pacific, it is clear that we need to have the ability to act in this region. The second thing which is very important is to try to develop strong partnerships. We have already some, I mean the transatlantic one, the EU-NATO uh, cooperation, which should uh, make progress. And we know that there is a lot of difficulties related also to the state of the alliance, but we need to work in order to, to have stronger partnership. It is true with the United States and the transatlantic partners, and a lot was said in the Biden-Macron communique of last Friday, but there is a, lo a lot of salt to, to, to do regarding, for example, the relation with Africa or the relation with Indo-Pacific and to have uh, some partners able also to take their part and to bring uh, their contribution to the global uh, security. The third thing, as was stated also by Minister Limetz, is the strengthening of our resilience. It means our ability uh, to be protected against a cyber attack, against uh, uh, attacks against uh, our democracies and things like this. In general, we need to improve our resilience, but we need also um, to be able, in fact, to be stronger. And a lot was said by Minister Limetz regarding um, the need for strengthening our resilience, the need for strengthening our ability to innovate and to be at the forefront of the technological edge, and the need also to reduce our strategic dependencies, because when we see what we have seen with the pandemic, there is also a lot uh, to do in this area. And that's why we think that we need to develop a real European um, defense industrial policy, and a lot was made with PESCO, with CARD, but also uh, with EDF, and we think that we need to go further. The last thing I will say is uh, our ability to work on the strengthening of our capabilities and capacities. Um, practically, from a practical point of view, when you need to act, you need to have critical enablers. Uh, I mean, ISR, uh, strategic transportation, force protection, and so on. And PESCO, CARD, EDF could uh, help a lot in order to do so. The second thing you need is the ability to work together between European armies. There is a lot of things which are uh, done on a practical um, way. We need to do better and more frequently in order to be able to act together. The third and last thing is to work in a more flexible way when it is needed. What we see with the world we are facing now is that we have to be flexible and sometimes to act in the framework of NATO, in the framework of the EU, in the framework of ad hoc coalition, and to make synergies between them. Sahel, or what we have done, for example, in the Arab Persic Gulf, is a good example of that. So to conclude, um, from our side, strategic autonomy and sovereignty is a Goal. Now the necessity is to uh, implement it and to, to work together uh, between the EU member states. And we think that a lot could be done and a big step taken with the endorsement of the strategic compass in March 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Claire, for this very, very structured also to-do list. Um, and we come back to you um, later on also with a question what to expect um, from the French Council presidency next year. Um, now, you, Claire mentioned that the EU needs strong partners, um, which leads me immediately to you, Julian. Um, the, well, Great Britain, the UK is unfortunately not a member anymore, as we all know. Um, but what I would like to ask you is, how can we strengthen the partnership? What role does the UK play in the um, EU and European security security structure um, and 
Also, I would like to ask you, how do you perceive the idea of European strategic autonomy with regard uh, to defense? Is that at all possible from your perspective? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in uh, the European Union being a really important security actor. Uh, it is a security organization. Uh, I had a small part to play as the commissioner for the security union. Um, uh, I didn't have a direct uh, successor in this commission. In fact, they asked five commissioners to work on security union issues, which shows, I think, uh, the importance the commission attaches to moving forward uh, this agenda. And if you, if you stop and think about it, even for a moment, it, it's sort of obvious. Uh, the, the range of threats and challenges that we now face, I mean, the traditional ones haven't gone away, uh, as it, even Maria reminded us, uh, but uh, if you're thinking about terrorism, a uh, whole range of cyber challenges, including uh, political uh, interference and uh, dis and misinformation, uh, the need to uh, be resilient, uh, to secure our critical infrastructure, uh, all, all of those are issues where the European Union has a really important role to play. Uh, many of those issues uh, involve cooperation with a, a wide range of partners, civilian, uh, industrial, and other partners, uh, and uh, a flexibility in a range of, of, of policy approaches and policy instruments, uh, which the European Union uh, can bring to bear. Now, uh, uh, there are roles for other security organizations and other security partnerships as well. Uh, I hope that we're going to be able to have uh, in the future close cooperation between uh, the UK and European partners and allies on, on many of these challenges. Uh, just at the moment, I don't think I'll surprise you if I say that the relationship with between the UK and the European Union as such on these issues it is going to be complicated. Uh, uh, particularly while we have uh, this government uh, in uh, the UK. Uh, they made very clear, Prime Minister Johnson, when he came in, made clear that they didn't want to have a structured, formal, organised cooperation with the European Union uh, on, on security uh, and um, defence issues. Uh, and I don't think they've changed their minds uh, on that. And at the moment, um, uh, just putting it politely, uh, the political relationship between uh, the British government and the European Union is, um, is complex. Um, we may want to talk about that a little bit more, but this is not a discussion about, uh, about, about Brexit, it's a discussion about security and defence. Uh, but if you look beyond uh, the, the, the shorter term, uh, these are obviously shared challenges, and we're talking about defending shared values. Uh, and so I think that the uh, UK will want to reach out and find ways of working together with partners. One way is obviously through NATO, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about the contribution that NATO can make as well as a core military alliance with core deterrence uh, responsibilities to the range of challenges we face. Uh, and there will be bilateral cooperation, including with uh, European allies, uh, bilaterally and in small groups with the UK. And the UK can engage, obviously, on a range of these issues uh, multilaterally with partners and allies. Uh, and some of these issues are, are going up the multilateral agenda. So uh, a, a lot of the issues that revolve around uh, technology uh, and indeed wider resilience, including now health resilience, are going up the international uh, and UN agendas. And uh, th those conversations are also important. They have an important security dimension uh, where the UK will, will play a very active part. Thank you so very much. And I, I, um, I very much liked the first st statement which you made that the EU is a security actor. Um, I think some might be a little bit more critical here and also pointing at the, at the deficits, but I like um, the optimistic sound um, of that statement. Um, and I would love to come back to that also in the discussion. And um, Julian, as you said, we also need to talk about multilateral cooperation. And I also certainly want to come back to you and 
um, get your input on where we currently stand in NATO and with NATO review um, and cooperation in NATO. But before we do this, I also want to hear um, from Claudia. Claudia, you are um, not just a NATO expert, you're an expert on European security, but you're also an expert on what's going on here um, in Germany after the elections and with the new parties. And I think this is um, of great interest to all of our um, uh, audience uh, viewers to get a bit of more of an understanding um, what we can expect um, from the new coalition when the traffic light coalition um, takes over. Thank you. Um, indeed, I think this is the, the, the big question. What can we expect from the new government? What is this uh, coalition negotiation going to give us? Um, and, and to be very honest, um, I don't want to engage in, in any speculations because it's really too early. In the moment, uh, the three parties are negotiating the coalition treaty with all the details. They want to have it ready at the end of November, and we are likely to have the, the new government in power in 6th of December. This is what they said. So no speculations, but the good thing is we have what we call in, um, in German the exploratory paper. The exploratory paper is the first paper on which the three coalition partners agreed and where they put not all elements in, but some of the major points they wanted to highlight. And this actually gives us a first impression on what to expect on foreign security and defense issues. And um, to, to come, on, come up to uh, Stormy's last point, I want to be optimistic too. So I just give you two, two points from that exploratory paper because there are two really positive points in. And the first is a really strong commitment to Europe. Um, and I quote, we want to enhance Europe's strategic sovereignty. We want to strengthen the European Union in order to strengthen Germany. And this is why we want to define German interest in the light of European interest. We want an active Europe policy, um, including a strong Franco-German partnership. And that's obviously things that are not really surprising from a German government, but it's still good to have that strong statement also in the wording of European strategic sovereignty. And the second point, um, which was also watched with much interest, was a very strong commitment to NATO. So again, I'm quoting, the transatlantic alliance is a central pillar and NATO is an indispensable part of our security. So we have a strong commitment, not only to our partners, but also to the main frameworks in which security and defense in Europe are organized. The question obviously is as always in the detail and the details are currently being negotiated. It's the, it refers to defense spending. Um, it refers to clearer commitments also with regard to the nuclear questions um, and it's a stronger commitment or what we actually say, for example, on topics you mentioned, uh, Madame Ambassadrice, on defense industrial cooperation. So this is all to come, but I'm really willing to take the positive stance um, from the exploratory paper and not to engage in any, oh, this is all going to be really difficult. So let's wait for that. If I can just add two little points. Um, the role that Germany had um, in the past in security and defense in Europe, in political terms, was to a large extent the role of a, I would say, political keeping the house together. So Germany very often acted as a moderator between various, between differences, between those who were looking more to Russia as a threat and those who were looking more to the South as a threat, for those who were more convinced Europeanist and those who were more convinced Atlanticist. And Germany tried to a large extent to bring those various groups together, also bring in the voices and positions of smaller countries in order to forge an agreement. So to some extent, what I call keeping the European house together. And that role of a moderator and bringing different positions together is a crucial one that not many countries can actually play in Europe. Also because other countries take more, take stronger positions, if I might say, uh, to put it in a diplomatic way. Um, so the kind of political bringing countries together, forging consensus um, and compromise is a crucial role. The second, in military terms, Germany can actually serve as an enabler. What we can observe over the past is that Germany engaged in very close military cooperation with many European countries. Um, for example, Germany integrated Atlant forces with the Netherlands. Germany and Hungary are cooperating very closely. Germany and Norway are cooperating very closely. And that means 
if Germany funds its military the way it should do it, the way it promises to you and NATO, it will be strong and its European partners will be strong. But that comes with a responsibility. That means if we don't fund our armed forces the way we promised, if we don't live up to our European and NATO commitments, German weakness translates into European weakness. And I think the, the, the crucial point is that those two roles, the political role of keeping the house together, plus a military role of enabling other countries are really two crucial roles. If the next government would be able to combine it with bringing some more ideas to move from that debate on European capacity to act to implementation, um, that would be really grateful. And I'm really hoping for that in this coalition treaty. Thank you very much uh, for this overview um, and looking into the crystal ball um, or doing some tea leaf uh, reading. Um, and um, I also want to remind um, our, our audience that you can already write Q&As into the Q&A function, but I will also call on you um, to ask questions. Um, for that, you need to raise your electronic hand, which you can um, already do, um, and I would get to you at, I would say, um, 12.50 about, um, so that we have another 20 minutes then for engaging um, you, our audience. Um, until then, I would like to pick up a few um, points um, made by our um, speakers. And um, I, I know that we have had a, a positive note so far. Um, I also would like to come back though to some of the deficits um, in the European Union and um, security and defense policy. And I would like to come back to you, Claudia, asking you when we talk about capabilities and capacities and old threats and new threats, how well are we actually prepared to act together? Where are our deficits? Um, and maybe you can also already tell us a little bit where you think um, the way the way <laughs> to address these deficits would be. That's 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 a rather big question. Big, very big question. <laughs> <laughs> I think the key the key word here really is is a cooperation uh, and coordination. Um, if you look at the traditional military threats, um, and we could. Uh, if we would do a very quick threat analysis, we could look at the regional threats and those in Europe and surrounding Europe, and that would include things like Russia, Russia, who has a nuclear dimension, a conventional dimension, but also a hybrid dimension, which goes from fake news up to cyber, um, uh, trying to actually undermine European societies. Um, we can go down to the southern flank with uh, fragile states um, and instability. So they have the kind of regional circle around. Then they have the international, what I would call the international circle, where you look, for example, to China and other regions um, who might not be an enemy, but who, who are actually a challenge uh, to the European way of doing things and to our understanding of global order. So you have regional, you have international, and then you have a kind of third dimension, which I would call the cross-cutting threats. And these are things like new technologies, for example, who are not, not regionally bound, um, but actually come from various direction. And the question is, how can European countries address those threats? And then I come back to what I initially mentioned with coordination. You have, you have to coordinate with what you can do on the national level, what you can do at the EU level, and what you can do at the NATO level. Um, and then again, you have to coordinate um, state responses. What can the state do, for example, in the military realm? Um, but then you also have to integrate or you have to cooperate with the private sector. If it's, for example, about protecting critical infrastructures um, or if it's about media uh, and protecting or dealing with fake news. So the real key issue which we have to, to recognize is that not only the states cannot do it on their own. So the states have to cooperate and they have to cooperate within the EU, uh, within NATO and in other formats, but also we have to, to, to deal or we have to include private sector and others. So the, the biggest challenge is really bringing those various actors together in a meaningful way and assure the coordination and cooperation between the various actors and between the various levels. And that's quite a big thing to do. And we still have some way to do, I would say, in Europe on that one. 
And Julian, I saw you nodding a couple of times. Um, do you agree? Uh, uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, I think that there's still a lot of work to do uh, and that uh, we're being positive about the contribution that the uh, EU can make as a, as a framework for addressing some of these issues. Uh, but uh, uh, other organizations, uh, multilateral organizations, and uh, on the harder end, NATO, are going to have a key role to play in, in building the capabilities and reinforcing the cooperation, uh, as, as Claudia has just set out. Uh, NATO is going to have a role to play on uh, core deterrence against uh, uh, threats from Russia. Uh, and it's going to have a role to play uh, on helping the allies to think through and adapt to um, challenges that come from a systemic rival like, like China. Uh, so I think that uh, the, the benefits we get from working together closely uh, as Europeans in the EU, uh, I, I don't want to downplay, uh, but they're one part of a wider picture of cooperation, coordination and building capabilities. So I, I agree with what Claudia said. And um, how about you, Eva Maria? Um, do you also share the view that we still have quite a bit to do? Sorry, I missed a part uh, of your sentence. Uh, uh, I, I share the view on uh, exactly on what Yes, oh, well, I mean, to become a real security actor, um, if we are already there, or if we still have um, a little bit of homework to do and what the homework um, might be. Uh, I would say that as the security uh, environment is uh, constantly uh, changing, uh, it means that also our homework uh, has to be always um, appropriate and always changing uh, so that uh, we would be always ready uh, for uh, uh, new uh, security uh, threats and uh, challenges uh, and uh, therefore also I think uh, the, uh, the whole work that we are doing uh, especially uh, with the uh, strategic uh, concept in the EU but also with the strategic uh, I'm sorry a strategic compass within the EU and the strategic concept uh, in the NATO, uh, they, um, uh, they, these documents have to give us uh, appropriate assessment of also about the security environment where we are, uh, where we are at the moment and also give uh, the tools how to uh, uh, cope with these um, uh, threats and challenges. And as um, here today, we speak more about the um, uh, European uh, Union uh, activities and uh, actions, uh, uh, I would um, uh, say with regard to strategic compass that um, it is very uh, welcomed uh, process uh, of the European Union at the moment. And uh, um, uh, there are many things that we can do to, to make the EU more relevant in, in uh, the international uh, arena, which has been also the uh, uh, ambition of the, uh, of the Union. Uh, and um, uh, but in um, uh, this process, uh, uh, we um, uh, we shall agree on this uh, document that enable us to use the EU security toolbox as efficiently as as possible. Uh, there are many uh, many uh, means available uh, for the EU, and uh, at the same time. Um, we have to keep in mind uh, the inherent division of security tasks between the EU uh, and, and NATO. And here I also would like to agree with, uh, with Julian, what he just uh, said about the uh, cooperation between the two uh, uh, institutions. Thank you so much. Um, and before I hand over to Claire, we also already have the first um, two questions, which I want to um, kind of throw at all of you. Um, and um, the first question I ask about um, heart defense and the European army um, or European uh, command. And this is Leander Holweg who asked um, if we are all aware that that might be actually um, a challenge for Germany, because under our constitution, it's not so easy um, to delegate that power to the European um, Union. And I think he's also asking if we actually do need a European army. 
Um, so whoever of you wants to pick up, maybe Claudia also, um, we come back to that question in a second, um, Leander. And the second question which was raised was one on partnership um, and um, specifically the um, United States. And here the question is, um, the US is currently very actively for looking at different partners, following a pretty pragmatic approach, um, working with those partners in those regions where it expects the greatest um, success and, and outcome. And I think this is something we could see with regard to AUKUS. And the question here is, is how can the EU become a more reliable partner um, in, well, in our immediate neighborhood, um, but also um, in other regions. But before we pick that up, um, Claire, let me come back to you and also ask you where you see our homework and what may be on the agenda next year with regards to security issues. Many thanks, uh, Stormy. Um, in fact, I, I do agree with the other panelists. Uh, there is a lot of things to do. I think that uh, the main conclusion should be we need to be uh, stronger inside and stronger outside for the EU. Basically, that uh, stronger inside means uh, having a real uh, European uh, industrial policy in the field of uh, defense and security. Uh, in order to have uh, the capabilities which are necessary, but also to be able to be at the technological edge. Um, and it would make us as a re rela reliable partner and as a very interesting partner. That's the first thing. And the second thing is stronger outside. And for being stronger outside, there is first to uh, manage our neighborhood. And it's something which is not easy because of uh, the threats uh, we are uh, facing. And uh, there is a role for the EU, there is a role for NATO, and there is a role for the coordination and cooperation between uh, European states and, uh, and transatlantic partners in general. And there is also our ability to act uh, very far from Europe, if need be. And uh, on this also, we need to get uh, more capabilities and, uh, and capacities. And um, I will join uh, the next question on the European Army. I think that the uh, European Army is a concept, is an objective, is a, is a way of uh, thinking uh, the way in order to make progress. But what is the most important is um, to try to improve the coordination and cooperation between the different uh, armies of uh, member states and be able to work together and to be able to work together in a more reactive, flexible, flexible and robust way. Thanks. Thank you so much. So who would like to um, tell us a little bit about um, a European army and where Germany stands um, on this? Can I hand? Thank you, Claudia. Yeah. Um, my, my first reaction would be, this is such a German idea. Um, if you walk around in Europe, um, we always kind of talk about this European army and many other countries. I'm wondering a little bit, and um, if I look to Julian, it's certainly not something that goes down very well in the UK. Um, so first, I think we have to recognize that's a pretty much a German idea. And to some extent, it, it frightens many other countries because it touches upon those really difficult issues like giving up sovereignty, um, trusting someone else for, for the defense, survival of the nation. So actually, I, I, I don't like to use that word anymore. And I think, and here I'm again, I'm with Claire, um, I think we should rather concentrate on what we have already. And we have so many islands of cooperation where states out of their own interest decided to cooperate because they want it. And not because someone told them, here is the wonderful idea of a European army, please implement. But rather because countries said, hey, why not cooperating together? Because we get something out of it. And this is what the Brits do with the JEF, um, Joint Expeditionary Force. This is what we have with Nordic cooperation. This is we have to a certain extent with a very close Franco-German cooperation. So we already have that. Um, you can also take operational experience like the Task Force Takuba, where European Special Forces cooperate. Uh, we have a Dutch frigate in the UK carrier group. You can also look at cooperation on the industrial realm, which not always works perfectly, but uh, there's certainly a willingness with France, Germany, and Spain trying to build the next generation of an aircraft together. So you actually have lots of islands of cooperation. And for me, the biggest 
question and challenge is how we bring those islands together in a meaningful way. Because in the end, it's, it's not about, it's also about, but not primarily about beautiful concepts. It's about implementation. How do we get the things we need in order to defend what we have built in Europe? And if I can just say one more word on this European army thing, um, because maybe that's because I'm German and I have to come back to the concept. Um, just very quickly say what it would actually mean, because it would not only mean a challenge for us in Germany, but for others too, because it would mean that we have a security policy community, that we agree on an objective, that we agree possibly on a political authority who would then decide where to send this army. We would, we would need a kind of parliamentary approval thing who would be that parliament, the European parliament, I doubt. So the political community would be a difficult one. We would need a military community where all those countries would agree on a military strategy, which I don't really see, see to happen in the moment, uh, and agree on a defense policy. Third, so political community, military community, we, need, we would need a capacity or capability community. Um, so agree on what we want to procure and how and how to harmonize our defense industry. Defense industry for many countries is about national sovereignty. So that would not be an easy one. And the last question would be the legal question. Are we all willing and able to harmonize our military law? For some countries, it would mean an upgrade. For some countries, it would mean a downgrade on what soldiers are allowed to do or, or can do or cannot do. So if we would be able to agree to be a political community, a military community, a kind of defense industrial capability community and a legal community, we would have a European army. But I think we all agree on that panel that this is not anytime soon for tomorrow. And that's why my call would focus on the small islands of cooperation that work because countries want to have it and try to bring those islands of cooperation in the capability domain, in the industrial domain, in the operational domain, bring them together uh, and coordinate. I think that's the way forward um, for the next years for these very clear words. And Eva Maria, it looked like you also wanted to jump in. Yeah, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, maybe uh, compared to the previous speaker, I don't add too much, but uh, I think that it is uh, very, um, in our current uh, world, uh, we see often that um, it is characterized by a strong emphasis on, on sovereignty. Even in the European Union, at the beginning of the Corona crisis, we saw how countries first thought only of, of themselves. And it, uh, it, it happens again and again when the crisis emerges. So I, I think that um, it is kind of tendency we have to keep in mind all the time. But our interest in global power struggle uh, has to um, be to maintain our unity and, and also solidarity. And um, um, in fact, I also believe that this is already uh, uh, ongoing um, and um, it applies also, for example, to value-based uh, cooperation in the world. And uh, many, many examples were just uh, drawn. Um, uh, and when we speak also about the development of military mobility, uh, resilience and uh, hybrid areas, the EU already cooperates uh, uh, very closely together with, with NATO. And it is very important to, to, to uh, emphasize it because the cooperation is there in these important areas. And um, yes, please, Julian. So just very briefly, um, uh, the, I, know, I know people keep coming back to uh, talking about the European army and, uh, and, and I understand that sometimes it has political um, resonance uh, in at least some countries. Uh, but it actually gets in the way of cooperation. That's the trouble. That's the disadvantage of talking about a European army. Uh, what we really do need is serious investment in uh, European uh, military capability. Uh, and in particular, we need serious investment in um, force readiness, actual deployability, both uh, in terms of expeditionary activity uh, that uh, Claire was talking about earlier on, uh, where there are questions of organization and will, but there are also questions of military capability. But we also need to remember uh, core deterrence. Core deterrence means having a credible, deployable, rapidly deployable force that you're hoping you won't have to use. 
because it's, it's, its readiness deters others from taking action against you. All of that requires real investment. So that's what we should be focusing on rather than the badges. Great, thank you so much. Um, and Claire, you wanted, also wanted to come in, right? No, no, okay. <laughs> um, we already answered um, not just, um, not just uh, Leander's question, but also in part Emre's question um, when we talked about the idea of a European army. Um, there was another question which came in with regard to qualified majority voting within the European Union, and that is a good idea for the security field. Um, and who, who could pick up that question? Yes, Claire. Yes, many thanks, because it is a question which is um, quite uh, often raised, and uh, I think that uh, the answer is uh, still still the same. I think that um, in a certain manner, when this quite kind of question is put on the table, it means that uh, we have a problem. I mean that we have no possibility uh, as a European Union, as 27 member states, to act. And that's why we are looking after some... Uh, legal uh, solution uh, in order to, 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 to move forward. The reality is that now what we see in the EU is that it is important for everybody uh, to be uh, on board. And uh, we understand why, because uh, in the security and defense field, uh, there is a, a need for everybody to, to, to give up in a certain manner its sovereignty in order to, uh, to, 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 to meet around a, a solution, an EU solution. And that's why from our side, we think that we can have this kind of debate, but we know that it would be impossible for some member states to go uh, into that direction. And what uh, we can do uh, on the contrary is the following. What we think from our side is that in fact, we need to regain the appetite for uh, operational uh, progress. I mean, sometimes when we are blocked uh, because there is one difficulty with one, two, three, five, uh, ten member states, it's because these member states have a constitutional or a foreign policy constraint, and we need to respect this. But it is also because sometimes uh, for, for, for them, it's uh, difficult to go on this field, on this theater, to accept this and this and this, and they need also to, to have time. And what we think is that we need to work in fact in two fields in a very pragmatic manner and without um, uh, putting uh, objection to everybody. There is one field which is CSDP. When we can, we can use it and we have to use it and it has to be the priority. And we need to regain uh, the, the political will to act together 27 uh, by unanimity. This is the first thing. There is a second possibility which exists in the framework of the treaty is that sometimes it's Article 44 of the um, TEU uh, and that uh, everybody is, um, knows uh, very well, and which means that you can decide to act at 27, but uh, um, to, to, to put on the table a coalition of the winning and the member states willing to participate in uh, this operation as a possibility to act. This is the second possibility. And the third possibility is when it is too difficult, you can have a European uh, operation. And uh, I will uh, try to make, uh, to, to take the example of Sahel, which is very telling. Um, in Sahel, we are able as Europeans to be part of the UN mission, MINUSMA, with those willing to do so. There is some others taking part in the Balkan operation, and we have member states with friends together in the Balkan operation, and I mean especially to Estonia, and thank you again for the support. There is the CSDP mission 27 EUTM, which goes till a certain point of uh, its ability to do. And for those willing to do more, there is Takuba with the cooperation with special forces. And when we see Takuba, it's an ad hoc operation, but in reality, it's an ad hoc European operation. And we can act together in a 
form of qualified majority, if I may use the word, but uh, in a pragmatic manner. And uh, um, by doing so, I think that we are making more progress and putting again on the table the issue of the qualified majority. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much. And uh, the questions are coming in and I would now also like to, to call on um, a few of our participants. And I would like to start with uh, Rainer Meyer zu Felde. And after this, I would also like to call on Elmar Brook. Um, the floor is yours. Um, Rainer Meyer zu Felde, you just have to unmute yourself um, yeah. and you can speak to us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello to everybody. A great, interesting discussion. My point is that the issue for the Europeans is not anymore these uh, low level, small crisis management operations in the South uh, that needs to go on, of course. But the real issue is what can we do with regard to China and to Russia and possibly both ganging up against us in a geopolitical competition? And that means um, NATO on the one side and EU on the other needs need to mutually reinforce each other in a supporting, supported relationship. And that goes far beyond the current modus operandi of staff to staff contacts. And we need to train and exercise proce procedurally the cooperation of the councils of both organizations and the key committees, such as military committee, plus the capitals of the respective organizations. We did that last time in the late 1990s, early 2000 years. And since then, we have never reached the same level of cooperation anymore. And my view would be, we need to work on that and, and we need fresh ideas how to de-block these uh, blockage of organizational cooperation uh, uh, in order to prepare Europe for defense in, and as a geopolitical uh, actor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and now I would like to give the floor to Elmar Brook. Mr. Brook, you have to unmute yourself. Um, there seems to be... No. Here we I'm go. Now. You can yeah. hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. No, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, for a lot of information. And I must say that we are in principally not so far away from each other. And uh, thanks uh, to see you again, you. And uh, I have a short question. Uh, for sure, it's said uh, rightly that the European army at the moment is not possible. That's also my opinion, because every armament, any every army needs a parliament to control it, in the one or the other way. This is in Europe not existing under the subgroups. Therefore, it's not possible. And um, therefore, we can have only this question of cooperation, which is rightly said here, and as far as people especially to think about. Uh, uh, Dr. Meyer said about, Mario said about uh, the islands. But these islands we have partly 20, 25 years longer. And the European Union has shown its inability, or the member states, better to say, to connect these islands and to make these islands operationally po uh, possible. This is also even uh, the point in uh, the question of industrial cooperation. If you see this. Uh, not very uh, progressive cooperation between Paris and and uh, and Berlin, for example, in the tank and in the uh, in the air fighter question. Uh, then I think it could be done better, uh, also by using more the European Defense Agency, which is not used enough. Uh, but does it not need a structure, both in a military way when it comes to command structures, always? Uh, um, not against NATO, but in cooperation with NATO. And on the other side, also in other political question, when it comes to decision making, when it comes, for example, to connecting the industrial <laughs> policy, the trade policy, and the foreign policy question, for example. And I see, for example, Julian, you might know it better, that trade at the moment is not in the foreign policy cluster of the European Union anymore. 
in your time in the commission, it was so. It's a catastrophe when we see to connect the islands in these questions. Who should be responsible for making the connections? Mm -hmm. uh, I think here we need a certain progress in the European Union. The present way, uh, leave it to the member states, does not work as we have seen in the last 20 years, or does not work alone, make it precise. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would like to call on one uh, last participant before I give it back to our, um, our panelists, and that is Michel Ogar from um, joining us from London. Michel, do you want to uh, take the floor? Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for the very beautiful discussion. I would like to go back to Sir Julian King's statement when he came and he said there's there's most probably no structure going to be there. There's most probably no formal cooperation going to be. And um, I was just wondering, let's hope we will not have a situation of crisis in the future where we will ask ourselves whether it would have not have been better if we had institutionalized formal structures of cooperation because ad hoc cooperation is not always the best of all possible ways. So is it possible to think of a clear job sharing and um, a clear commitments on both sides, one hand UK and the other one hand um, European Union with clear mandates so that in a, in a situation of crisis, we do not have to end up in debates and discussions, but we, you know, each party knows what to do. This was really a bouquet on uh, different questions and different aspects. Um, since the last question was directed to, Ju to you, Julian, um, let's, let's start with you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I, I agree with the first questioner uh, uh, very much that we need to face up to the fact that geopolitics is, is shifting and that there are some real challenges that flow from that, uh, which have a spectrum, but that spectrum includes the possibility of, of, of military challenges. Uh, and I, I fear that's true with uh, a number of countries who are challenging uh, our shared liberal democratic values, including uh, Russia and uh, in some respects, China. In order to meet those challenges, we need the maximum cooperation uh, as we've all been underlining. And I think that one of the things that we need to do in the EU and in NATO, respectively, is be less defensive about what can be discussed within those organizations and between those organizations. So uh, this links with Elmer's question of, of how, do you, how do you join up some of the existing islands of cooperation? Uh, on, on the uh, NATO side, uh, I think that means being ready to talk about um, the military dimension of challenges related to, to China, for example. Uh, on the EU side, I think that means uh, being ready to mainstream security and security considerations through a range of policies. Uh, historically, uh, the EU has had some trouble doing that. Uh, uh, it, it's great that the, the, the COPS exists and has been developed, but it mustn't, it mustn't mean that security is dumped uh, in one part of the European Union and not taken responsibly uh, in other areas. Uh, so we have managed to mainstream some security considerations around industrial policy, uh, but even there, uh, there are breaks on cooperation to do with just retour and the degree of openness to partnership without, with, with non-EU uh, partners. We've been quite bad, uh, I say we, uh, uh, the, the EU has been quite bad, uh, including when I was involved, in mainstream security considerations in aspects of our, of our regulatory work uh, and, and our, our wider policy making. And I think we need, uh, the EU needs to get better at that kind of mainstreaming. And lastly, uh, on, on Michelle's question, uh, I, I hope that we will get closer cooperation on foreign and security policy between the UK and the EU in the future. Uh, but it, at the moment, uh, it, it's not going to happen in a structured way. We just have to, we have to, ex we have to face that reality. 
Uh, and I don't think, therefore, that it, at the moment it's going to be possible to have a sort of formal division of roles. Uh, nor do I think that's necessarily the best way of, of, of thinking about the problem. Uh, I think that we need to find a way of building the cooperation in the areas where it exists and growing the cooperation, if you like, uh, so that um, at least while we have the current government in the UK, uh, the fact that there isn't structured formal cooperation between the UK and the EU um, doesn't stop a, 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 a range of, of, of cooperation, uh, including on foreign policy and, and military matters, because it's, it's grown up in practice from bilateral cooperation, the kind of um, group cooperation that, that Claudia was talking about, Jeff and others, uh, and uh, through uh, other organizations, NATO and the UN and a range of other multilateral organizations that fill out uh, the substance of that cooperation. Thank you so, so much for these, again, for these very clear words. Um, over to you, Claire. So, sorry, I have a problem with my, my mic. Um, I will uh, just um, uh, answer to uh, two, two questions. I, I think, uh, yes, on the first on the island and the necessity to, to, to connect. Um, I think that this is uh, something on, need, on which we need to, to work on, uh, in, uh, on two tracks, in fact. So there is a, the need and, uh, for member states to cooperate between themselves, and this is a very pragmatic approach and is useful. And we have to use also the EU um, uh, regulatory framework of the, regarding the industrial policy. And I think that a lot could be done. And uh, from our side, uh, we think that the good work was uh, done by commission with uh, its uh, action plan uh, for the synergies between civilian defense and space industry, which was a real, um, real thing regarding the way how to frame uh, the thinking about how to we, we can move forward. It's true also with uh, the initiative we are uh, put by the EU on the table. I mean, for example, the one of the um, uh, semi, uh, con uh, semiconductors and so on, which is very useful. And it's a true example of uh, the strategic dependency we have for our industry and especially our defense industry. And we think that uh, the next paper, which will come from the commission, I mean, the defense package uh, early 2022, uh, with the roadmap for the critical technologies and the reduction of strategic dependencies in the field of defense, could be also something useful in order to frame and to to make um, to make uh, more progress regarding uh, the way how we can cooperate and regain uh, the cap capabilities uh, we are uh, lacking. And the second question uh, on which I will react is uh, was the first one on the cooperation with the yes regarding the big threats. I think that there is one role one role for NATO, especially regarding collective defense, and it's true, especially regarding Russia. And for the rest, uh, the general dimension of uh, your answer and the approach should be the following. I mean, the need that we need to be a stronger and more reliable and more capable uh, partner, able to support and to um, support a world space uh, order. And for doing so, we need to be um, stronger inside and then we will be uh, stronger outside. Thank you. Thank you so much, stronger inside and stronger outside. Over to you, Eva Maria. Uh, thank you, thank you. Very um, relevant and important comments were made. Uh, uh, I would like to also emphasize uh, that um, uh, in the current uh, uh, geopolitical environment and uh, while taking into account the changes in the geopolitical environment, uh, uh, the unity and cooperation is of importance uh, that we have already spoken here today as well. And um, uh, I think that it's also good to uh, recall the uh, uh, recent uh, NATO summit where uh, these uh, uh, current uh, geopolitical uh, challenges were very properly uh, reflected, especially challenges for the uh, Euro-Atlantic era. And um, um, 
uh, also when we talk about the EU US cooperation, uh, for example, uh, uh, we agreed uh, this year we agreed on on dialogue on uh, China and on dialogue on on uh, Russia. Uh, these uh, um, agreements also reflect uh, uh, the current um, uh, geopolitical challenges. But it also shows that there is a, a political will on both sides to uh, discuss these issues. And uh, this is very important that like-minded countries uh, continue to discuss it. And uh, I, I truly hope that this unity, uh, in spite of uh, time to time differences, in spite of these differences, time to time, this unity and cooperation uh, of like-minded uh, countries uh, uh, continue. And uh, also from uh, from Estonia's perspective, uh, um, uh, security cooperation and defense cooperation with the UK is of importance uh, after the Brexit. Thank you so much, Eva Maria. And I know, uh, Julian, that you do have to leave on time. So uh, if you have to uh, jump off, I already want to thank you so much for joining us um, today. <laughs> and um, last but not least, um, over to you, Claudia. Thank you. Um, it's a pity Julian is leaving because I, I wanted to say a little thing about the EU-UK relationship. Um, I think what we could probably say is that we have a kind of short term perspective in the moment where we will not have any institutionalized cooperation just because Julian said it's a complex relationship, uh, we could probably just say the bridges are burned in the moment. Um, so what we can do in the short term perspective is ad hoc cooperation in informal formats um, and in the formats we have. So that is NATO, obviously, it's uh, the G7, it's uh, um, also things like, for example, the E3, so the big three European countries, France, Germany, and the EU, which is always a tricky one. Um, because all the other countries obviously in the EU watch what the big three are doing. So one way to actually give it a bit more legitimacy would to say we do an E3 plus X format. Well, for example, the high rep would be associated or according to the topics that are treated in an E3 meeting, you would add the countries that are the best place to deal with that topic. So if you talk about Eastern neighborhood, you could include Poland. If you look to the South, you could include Italy. So you have more legitimacy and being sure that the views of the other countries are involved. And if this kind of E3 plus X plus high rep plus NATO section or other countries um, help to keep the channels open and increase understanding, that would be great. You have other low key things that you could do. The US foreign minister attended as a guest a council meeting, something that the UK could do, but I think in the moment, just for normative reasons, that wouldn't work. So you have the short term perspective where you could only have that informal cooperation but particularly from a German point of view, in the long term, an institutionalized cooperation would be the way forward. Um, I think the, 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 the irony is the better the institutional cooperation between the UK and the EU is going, the more European countries like Germany would be interested in improving the bilateral relationship. So the better the EU and the UK are getting on, the easier it is for European countries also to engage in that bilateral relationship that the UK is looking for, for example, with Germany. Um, Samia, I think I stop here because we're running out of time. Um, so I, I, I skipped the China-Russia question and the institutional question, although I would be really tempted to say something of not over-focusing on institutions, but then here I'm teaming up with France, focus on implementation, not on those debates on institutional beauty, but really focus on capabilities. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'm sorry you are right. Um, there's so much more to say, but we are running um, out of time. Um, I want to um, thank all four of you, or no, all three of you, um, Dr. Claudia Mayor, um, Her Excellency Claire Rollin, and Her Excellency Eva-Marie Limetz for joining us today. Before I let you go, however, I do have to ask one last question, and I want you to answer in just one sentence, very quick. And this is... Um, what is your what would be your advice um, to the new German government? What should they prioritize in the first six months of their administration? Let's start with you, Claudia. <laughs> you mean in security and defense? Yes, absolutely. 
um, talking to the partners uh, and get them on board. Explain, explain, explain what we want to do and listen, listen, listen what the others expect us to do um, and build confidence and trust. Thank you so no much. No unilateral things, please. Talking and listening to the partners. And no unilateral action. Okay, no unilateral action. Claire, what would your recommendation be? Um, many thanks, Tommy. Same thing. Uh, I, I think uh, even if for me it's difficult to say things about that, but uh, uh, I think that what is important is uh, to cooperate, to talk, uh, and uh, to contribute to the work which is uh, ongoing. I mean, uh, the one of uh, the European uh, defense policy. Many thanks. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Eva Maria. Uh, thank you. For me, it's, of course, even more difficult to advise uh, a German government because I believe that every, every government has to listen to its own people first. Um, but uh, I would emphasize that I said in the beginning that from our perspective, uh, NATO uh, is a cornerstone of uh, Europeans' uh, uh, collective defense and, uh, and the unity uh, is... Uh, uh, or, shall be the strategic goal of, of our uh, foreign and security and defense policy actions. Thank you so very much. Um, this event would not have been possible today without our partner institute, Aspen France. Um, so thank you so much um, to Aspen France for supporting our event today and being so strong partners. And if you haven't checked out their webpage yet and what events are coming up, do so because we will continue the um, conversation on European sovereignty, strategic autonomy, and so is our partner institute, Aspen France. So thank you so very, very much. Um, I hope to see you all again, hopefully in person next time. And um, until then, I um, only want to say, stay, sa stay safe, stay healthy, um, and I hope to en enjoy the rest of the day and the afternoon. Thank you so much again for joining us today.